Won't you bow and be in prayer with me? For every mountain that you brought me over, for every trial in this last year you saw me through, for every blessing, Lord, for this I give you praise. We've seen some mountains. We've experienced some trials. And we've been the recipient of some blessings. So, Lord, do we say hallelujah tonight for bringing us to the last moment of another year's journey. When January came, we did not anticipate all we would go through. But here we are. And we give your name the glory. Now, Lord, I pray that you would work through the frailty of my flesh. Take my mind and my mouth, my hand and my heart. Use them for your glory. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Amen. In these last few moments of this year, in the last sermon, I'm going to ask you to hear the reading of a word of God that should sound familiar to us. It records an event that is familiar to us. It is recorded in the fourth chapter of the Gospel of Mark. If you're able to turn to those concluding verses, beginning in verse 35 in the fourth chapter of the Gospel of Mark, I believe that there's a word from the Lord that sets us in order for the new year that awaits us. Mark chapter 4, beginning in verse 35. Once you found it, if you're physically able, we invite you to stand for the reading of God's word as I read from the New International Version of the Bible, prayerful that you can keep along with whatever version you have before you. Mark 4, beginning in verse 35, when you're there, say amen. amen. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Mm -hmm. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, somebody say the back, the back. Yes. sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, <laughs> rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Don't stop reading verse 1, chapter 5. They went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. That's enough right there. Do me a favor. Play preacher to your neighbor for a moment and tell him, neighbor, neighbor. Oh, neighbor, oh, neighbor, I'm just trying, I'm just trying to, make to make it to the other side. The other side. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I'm just trying to make it to the other side. I, I'm asking you as I have just about this whole month to pray for me. I want to confess at the beginning of this sermon that there's a rough reality going on in my life that has not stopped yet. And it's left me stressed and exhausted. I want to be honest with you. I am stressed and I am exhausted because I've got class starting in two weeks, and I have not one, not two, not three, but 11 papers due January 13th at 11.59 p.m. And I'm stressed and burnt out. I'm burning the candle at both ends. I'm waking up at four in the morning to write, I'm staying up till midnight to read. 
I'm stressed and exhausted. I'm so stressed and exhausted that I really don't appreciate it when people ask me how my papers are coming. <laughs> I know you mean well, and you're trying to be compassionate, but every time someone asks me how my papers are coming, it reminds me of how much more I have yet to do. And I gotta let you know, it, it, it irks me. I'm, I'm, I'm stressed out, I'm exhausted. And because I'm a practicing Christian, and I don't want to cuss you out, <laughs> when people ask me how my papers are coming, Roderick, my answer now is, girl, I'm just trying to get to the other side. <laughs> you see, school has taken its toll on me, and I am sick and tired of being in class. I'm ready for these papers to be behind me. I'm ready for these classes to be behind me. I'm ready for this program to be behind Give me my degree. Because <laughs> all I'm trying to do is make it to the other side. You all, there are seasons that come in life that start off with joy and excitement and expectation. But at some moment, they take a toll on you and put you in a place where the joy is gone. And all you want to do is make it to the other side. I just want this to be behind me. If you've never been there, you can just talk to a pregnant sister. She'll tell you that pregnancy begins with joy and thrill and excitement. But at some moment in every pregnancy, a woman reaches the point where she's tired of being pregnant, tired of the swelling, tired of the sleepless nights. And she'll tell you, all I want is to get on the other side of delivery and walk into motherhood. You've never been there? Just find a marriage that's on the rocks. And they'll tell you it started with joy and love and Luther Vandross and Anita Baker making us feel mighty good. But then they hit that rough patch. The honeymoon was over. The thrill was gone. And they kept praying, Lord, just get us through this season and let this misery be on the other side so we can rekindle our joy. All you need to do is talk to someone who's gone through round after round after round of chemotherapy. And they'll tell you, even though the chemo is supposed to be healing me, I've reached a place, all I want is to get on the other side of these treatments and get my life back in order. All you need to talk to is a Redskin fan. <laughs> and they'll tell you, you start with joy at six and three, and then you lose six out of seven games and get blanked out at home by the Eagles in the last game of the year. And they were interviewing Redskins fans on the news last night, and one brother summed it up well. He said, I'm just glad this season is over. <laughs> and somebody, the truth be told, you've come to church tonight. You may not be a Redskin fan, but you know what it means to tell God, I'm just glad this year is over. I know some of us have reason to shout and thank God for the amazing things that happened this year, but there are a handful of folk in every pew who can declare, I'm grateful that this year is over. With all the hell I went through, with all the things I lost, with all the ups and the downs, I'm just glad to make it to the end of another year. And I'm sitting in Alpha Street tonight with the expectation that 2019 will be a new season. That something better is on the way. Something that pays me more is on the way. Someone who loves me more is on the way. 
something that appreciates me is on the way, something that is stable is on the way, something that loves me more is on the way, something that respects me is on the way. Is there anybody here that just expects the new year to be better than the last year? If so, then you've come to this moment tonight just wanting to get to the other side of 2018 and start your journey into the new year. And as you look out into this new year, the only prophetic promise I can make you is that 2019 will bring some more storms. If I know life the way I know life, I come by to tell you no matter how great and glorious your last year was, there's some stuff waiting for you in the new year. There's some heartache waiting. There's some disappointment waiting. Right now, God is getting someone you love. Their room is ready up in heaven. God is going to lead you through some storms in this new year. And you're going to reach the place where you've been in this past year. Lord, I just want to get to the other side. I came by to tell you in reflection of 2018 and in preparation for 2019 that there are some sanctified survival strategies that help you get through the storms and make it to the other side. To learn some of them, I got to take you back to some events you're familiar with in Mark chapter 4. When we get to Mark chapter 4, you're going to find out it's been a long couple of days for Jesus. Starts way back in chapter 2 when we find out that Jesus is in Galilee. That's his home where he began his ministry. And over these past few days, Jesus has had continual conflict with the scribes from the region. The scribes, list have come to not only challenge Jesus' authority, they've come to question his understanding of the Sabbath. And he goes back and forth with the scribes, arguing about the real interpretation of the Sabbath. But when you read Mark 2, 3, and 4, you find out that Jesus' biggest problem was not with the scribes. His biggest problem was with another group that Mark calls the multitude. Let the church say the multitude. When you read the multitude in Mark, I need you to know these are not the disciples. This is not the crowd that's committed. The multitude in Mark is a mass gathering of people who have heard the words of Jesus, have seen the miracles of Jesus, and they come to Jesus for one reason. They want Jesus to work on their behalf. This is not the sold out for Jesus crowd. This is not the carry the Bible crowd. This is not the sing amazing grace crowd. This is the crowd that wants something and only shows up when they need Jesus to do something for them. This multitude takes its toll on Jesus. They're always surrounding Jesus. And you're going to find when you read Mark 2, 3, and 4, the Bible says that Jesus has to escape from the multitude because they just won't Leave him alone. This multitude is so bad that they press on Jesus. And the Bible says that they reach out and grab Jesus. Imagine being in a crowd of a thousand people who are pulling on you because they believe if they can touch you, they will be healed. This crowd is so bad, Jesus can't even have lunch. He sits down to eat, and the crowd surrounds him and begins pulling on him. He doesn't even have time for a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. <laughs> this multitude, Ed, is so demanding that one day Jesus is teaching in a house 
The multitude surrounds him. His mama Mary shows up. And the multitude won't even let Mary in the sanctuary. Mary has to go to overflow. <laughs> because the multitude won't scoot over on the pew to let somebody sit on the end when the usher's trying to get them seated. Tell somebody, tell them, don't be the multitude. Don't be the multitude. <laughs> Zachlin, Jesus is so, so worn out by the multitude. Watch this, that at one point, he tells his disciples, listen, y'all go get me a boat, put it in the water, and keep the motor running. Says, I got a funny feeling and a sneaky suspicion. I'm going to have to make a quick exit away from these folk because they just won't leave me alone. And sure enough, one day Jesus is trying to teach the word of God. The multitude presses on him. He gets in the boat, sails off the shore a little bit so that he can then teach the multitude from the banks of the water while they stand on the shore because he needs some space. And the Bible says that when the sermon is over, when the benediction has been given, and when the sun goes down, Jesus turns to his disciples, and this is what he says to them. Let us cross over to the other side. He says it's time for us to make our way to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Now, say with me, saints, when Jesus says, let us cross over to the other side, with those eight words, he's already determined the destination. The problem is that he hasn't set the itinerary. You do know there's a difference between destination and itinerary. Destination is where you're going. Itinerary is what you got to go through to get there. He's told them where they're going, but he didn't tell them what they had to go through. So watch the itinerary. They get in the boat. They start sailing across the sea. All of a sudden, a storm comes. Water starts flooding the boat. The waves start rocking the boat. The winds start pushing against the boat. And the disciples, when they see water in the boat, waves rocking the boat, and wind pushing the boat, they realize we in trouble. We about to die. But don't worry, Jesus is in the boat. So they go looking for Jesus, <laughs> only to find him in the back of the boat. <laughs> Sleep. And they can't understand how Jesus is sleep in a storm. So they wake him up. Hey! Don't you feel the water in the boat? Can't you feel the waves rocking the boat? Don't you feel the wind pushing the boat? Jesus, don't you care that we're about to die? Watch what Jesus does. The Bible says Jesus stands up. stretches out, looks at the wind and the wave, and in Greek says two words, siopo fameo. Your Bible translates it as peace, be still. Says Gary, that's just a nice way. Here's what it really means. Siopo fameo in Greek literally means to shut the mouth with a muzzle. Uh, Jesus stands up, stretches, looks at the wind and the wave, and this is what he says. Shut up. And the Bible says that when Jesus tells the wind and the wave, see a pao for my o, this is what the wind and the wave say. <laughs> uh, my bad, Jay. Uh, 
We didn't know that was you on the boat. <laughs> uh, my apologies. Wind, stop blowing. Waves, settle down, because even the winds and the waves obey Jesus. And after Jesus rebukes the wind and the waves, he turns to the disciples and rebukes them. How can you be scared? You mean to tell me a little storm is all it takes for you to push the panic button in your life? You mean all it takes is a little contrary wind? All it takes is a little rocking of your boat? All it takes are some mouths running against you? All it takes are some haters in their heart? All it takes is some envy around you. That's all it takes to make you believe that you're going to die. How can you be a disciple of mine and be so weak and so wimpy and think that a little storm is all it takes to make you afraid? Jesus indicts the disciples by saying, listen, you should not have been afraid because you've got everything it takes to make it to the other side. This is how you make it through the storm. This is how you sail to the other side. This is how you endure the storm you've got to go through. Watch what Jesus teaches them. He tells them, we're going to cross over to the other side. But before that, Jesus says, we got to leave the multitude. Okay, okay you, you're a little slow. You'll catch it. Uh, uh, we're crossing over. But we can't take the multitude. Uh, we're headed somewhere, but everybody with us now cannot go where we're going because this journey is not for Lottie, Dottie, and everybody. Everybody ain't qualified to cross over with you. Beloved, I don't know who I came to preach to tonight, but let me tell you the problem in your storm is that you still got the wrong people with you. You're still trying to sail with the crowd, with the multitude. And Jesus teaches us that if you're going to sail over, you've got to make a decision that there's some people have to stay on the shore while you sail across the sea. Can I preach right here? I came by to tell someone on divine assignment that there's some folk in your life, they got 22 more minutes to be connected to you before the Lord tells them it's time for you to stay where you are. Because I've got to cross over. You can't take everybody with you. Notice who Jesus leaves. The multitude. I just told you who them jokers were. They were not committed. They were not in love with the Lord. This was the crowd that only showed up when they needed Jesus to do something. And the Lord says, that's who you got to leave behind. You got to leave behind the people that used you. You got to leave behind the people that took advantage of you. You've got to leave behind the people that stabbed you in the back. You got to leave behind the people that tried to take you out. You've got to learn who to leave behind. Now, now Joyce, let me tell you why why your neighbor hadn't shouted yet. Because most of you can't discern who the multitude is. Um, you're surrounded with people that look like your friends. And you have not yet learned that they smile in your face. And all the while, <laughs> Yeah, y'all ain't saved. Uh, all the while, they're trying to take your place that you've got some backstabbers and you've got some envious folk and you've got too many haters and too many little folk and petty folk around you. And the Lord says, those are not the people who can cross over with you. So here's what God did. And I want to put this in perspective. So this last year of your life, the Lord orchestrated some circumstances and situations that served one purpose, to open your eyes to the real character and nature 
of the people you were dealing with because they had you hoodwinked. They had you bamboozled. They had you run amok. But the Lord revealed their real nature. Now, you were upset when you found out they broke your heart. You were upset that it went down the way it did. But you ought to thank God that God opened your eyes so that you would know who cannot go with you. So watch this, how to make it over. Here's the bad news. You can't take everybody. But here's the good news. You have to take somebody. Read your Bible, read your Bible. Bible says Jesus got in the boat, told them we can't take the multitude, but the Bible says some little boats went with them. Uh, uh, the multitude stayed on the shore, but a few little boats crossed over with them because they found out that you need somebody to cross over with you. I don't care how big you are, how bad you are, how smart you are, how much money you make. Here is the fundamental truth. Everybody needs somebody sometime. Pause, rewind, press play. Everybody needs somebody sometime. Long Ranger needed Tonto. Batman needed Robin. Yogi needed Boo Boo. Harold Melvin needed the Blue Notes. And Beyonce needed them other girls. Everybody <laughs> needs somebody sometime. Bible says it wasn't a lot of boats. It was a few boats. Because the Lord wants you to learn you don't need a whole lot of folk. You just need a few folk. You need a few folk that pray for you. You only need a few folk that care about you. You only need a few folk that'll walk with you. You only need a few folk that'll sit down in your house and cry with you. All you need is a few good folk. I don't know who I can appreciate tonight, but I want you to know that if you got a few folk that love you, if you got a few folk that call you, if you got a few folk that check up on you, baby, you are blessed beyond measure, and you've got everything you need with a few folk. The challenge is to be discerning about who the few should be. That's why I love Bible. The Bible right here teaches you how to figure out who your few should be. Can I tell you how to determine who ought to go with you? The Bible says that the folk that crossed over with Jesus were the ones who were in boats, which means that this folk had boats to sail in with the Lord. Now, I told you a few minutes ago, Jesus told the disciples, get me a boat, put it in the water, keep the motor running. So there are some folk in the multitude, when they saw Jesus get a boat, they said, we're going to get a boat. <laughs> when Jesus got in his boat, they got in their boat. When Jesus started to sail that way, they went that way. Because this was the crowd that said, whatever the Lord is doing is what I'm going to do. Wherever the Lord goes is where I'm going to go. Your problem is that you're surrounding yourself with people who are not trying and striving to be like the Lord. When you look for your few, don't just look for tall, dark, and handsome. Don't just look for lips, hips, and fingertips. You got to find somebody that has the Lord in their heart. I need some folk who want to be like Jesus. I need some folk that want to do what Jesus did. I need some folk that want to act like Jesus acts. I need some folk that love God like the Lord loved him. And when you get that crowd, let me tell you how you know they're called by God. I love the Bible, Roger. Watch this. Jesus gets in the boat. A few boats start to sail. They all encounter the storm, and the few boats don't sail back. Okay, you, you missed it. Uh, we'll try it again. Jesus gets in the boat. A few boats sail with him. They all get caught up in the storm, and the boats that sail with them did not turn back. They stayed with him in the storm, because that's what you really need in life. Listen. Any joker can stand with you in the sunshine. 
any fool can get your back when the sun is rising. I need some folk that'll ride or die, that'll stay with me when the storm comes my way. <laughs> uh, uh, y- y'all, y- y'all don't get it? Uh, here, here, I'm going to read to you. Turn with me in your Bible uh, to the Gospel of New Edition. Um, right here, chapter 2, verse 1. Uh, on a perfect day, uh-huh, I know that I can count on you. Uh-huh, when that's not possible, <laughs> tell me, can you weather the storm? Because I need somebody who will stand with me through the good times and the bad times. They'll always be right here for me. Do me a favor, touch somebody and ask them, can you stand the rain? Uh, uh, And on this last night, of 2018, I know you want to thank God for the car he gave you. I know you want to thank God for the outfits you got on. I know you want to thank God for the money in your hand. But I want you to thank God right now because you can identify a few good folk that stood with you in the rain, that stood by your side, that did not abandon you, that did not run from you. Is there anybody here who knows I had a few good folk that took my back. I thank God for the few folk that stayed with me. So watch it, watch it, watch it. Uh, In order to make it over, you've got to have some good folk who stick with you through the storm. So these disciples, realizing they had a problem, they did what any good disciple ought to do. They talked to Jesus. And watch this. And when they talked to Jesus, (laughs) Jesus talked to the storm. You missed it. You missed it. Uh, They talked to Jesus. And when they talked to Jesus, Jesus turned around and talked to the storm. Because they found out what you should know by now. Uh, When you have a little talk with Jesus, which I had a prayer warrior right here, and, and you tell him all about your troubles, he'll hear your and the Lord will answer. There's somebody in this place tonight. Last year you had a talk with Jesus. And when you talk to the Lord, the Lord talked to your storm. The Lord talked to your supervisor. The Lord talked to your spouse. The Lord talked to your friend. The Lord talked to your finances. When you talk to God, God will talk to your stuff. Come on, I tell you, prayer changes things. Can can I get deep for a minute? Can I show you how powerful prayer is? I want to make sure you get this. Uh, Jesus is in a boat, and there are a whole lot of other boats in the storm. But Jesus is only in one boat. Okay, pop quiz. Jesus is in the storm. There are a whole lot of other boats. How many boats is Jesus in? Jesus is in one boat, which means the only boat that talked to Jesus was the boat Jesus was in. It's only one boat that had a talk with the Lord. Now, when they're in the storm, all the boats are affected. But because one boat spoke to Jesus, when Jesus spoke to the storm, every boat was blessed. I wish you wasn't stuck on slow. Because somebody ought to be grateful that the power of prayer is that when God answers her prayer, your life is going to get better. When God blesses him, you're going to get a blessing. God answers his prayer, and it blessed my life. Okay, okay. Um, um, some, somebody don't get it. Um, I'm going to ask you a question, and you ain't got to lie to me. Be real. Um, have you ever had the Lord do something in your life that you didn't pray for? I mean, I mean, has God ever shown up and dropped something in your lap uh, that you didn't even know you needed? Is there anybody that knows that he does go exceedingly, abundantly, above what you ask 
that when God answers, God gave you more than what you asked for. I finally figured out why God goes above what you asked for. Because when God answers somebody else's prayer, the overflow of their answer causes the abundance of your request. So you go to work with a coworker that you can't stand. Uh, 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 uh. She gets on your nerve every day. Now, the reason she's so difficult is because she's been on that job so long and the supervisor has never given her a promotion or a raise. But the reason the supervisor never gives a promotion or a raise is because the supervisor has a drinking problem. But the reason the supervisor has a drinking problem is because the supervisor is miserable at home with his wife. Now, the reason the supervisor is miserable at home with his wife is because his wife has some issues with her mama that ain't been resolved. And so all because a wife has issues with her mama, you are not dealing with a coworker who you can't stand. So one night, a wife with an issue bows down and asks God to reconcile her with her mother. When God answers and reconciles the wife with her mother, the wife starts being nice to her husband and the husband stops drinking, and the husband becomes a good supervisor who recognizes your co-worker's ability and gives them a raise and gives you a promotion. And so you got a promotion that you didn't even ask for because God answered the prayer of a woman you didn't even know. When God answers their prayer, It'll bless your life. You know what that means? That means we got to change some stuff, Ed. We've been singing the wrong song around here. We've been singing that song, somebody prayed for me, had me on their mind, took the time to pray for me. Let me tell you something. That song's a little flawed because you can take the for me out. You don't have to pray for me. You just pray. And when the Lord answers your prayer, The ripple effect is that my life is blessed. All I need you to do is talk to God, and when God shows up for you, God shows up for me. They wake Jesus up. (laughs) Anthony, watch what they say. This is funny. They say, "Uh, Lord, teacher, don't you care that we're drowning? If you're King James, you know it this way. Carest thou not... that we perish. <laughs> they wake Jesus up. I want you here to say, Lord, we are perishing. We, we, we. Somebody say we. we. First person plural. They're indicting everybody. Everybody on this boat is dying, including Jesus. Lord, Us is dying. (laughs) And part of the reason I believe Jesus is upset is because Jesus wants to look back and say, do you really think that I am going to die in a boat? (laughs) Uh, Do you think I came all the way from heaven through 40 and two generations to be born of a virgin in a manger only to get in the middle of the Sea of Galilee and die? Do you think the wind and the wave have the power over the Son of God? You must have lost your mind. I did not come here to die on a boat in the middle of a sea. I've got to get to the other side. Because on the other side, there's a woman with an issue of blood. Who needs to touch my garment? On the other side, there's a blind Bartimaeus whose eyes need to be opened. On the other side, there's a lame man by the pool of Bethesda. On the other side, there's an old rugged cross that's got my name on it. (laughs) 
And what gives Jesus assurance is that he sees himself on the other side. And beloved, here's the problem with most saints in the middle of a storm. You have no vision of yourself on the other side. Listen, if you're going to cross over, you got to see yourself over. You've got to see yourself on the other side of sickness. You got to see yourself on the other side of this shutdown. You've got to see yourself on the other side of this program. You've got to see yourself on the other side. So I came down here to mess with you tonight and ask you a question. When you look into 2019, what do you see? Do me a favor, look at somebody, just ask them, what do you see? Well, since you don't have an answer, let me help you. I'll give you a sneak peek. I see you walking in the favor of God. I see you as the lender and not the borrower. I see you with your student loans paid off. I see you with that new job you've been waiting on. I see you with a ring on your finger. I see you with a baby in your arms. I see you, but I don't recognize you because you lost 15 pounds. I see you. You've got to have a vision of yourself on the other side. Okay, I, I got to go. I'm tired. It's about midnight. Watch what happens. They wake Jesus up. Jesus said, listen, listen. You've got what you need. You've got a few boats with you. That's all you need. You've learned the power of prayer, that when you talk with me, I'll talk to the storm. I need you to have a vision for yourself on the other side. And watch it. When Jesus gets up, this gets me every time, he does not talk to the disciples first. He talks to the storm. Now, now, see, it just doesn't make sense to me that, that, Lord, if you know I'm panicking, I need you to talk to me first. I mean, that's the way it should have gone down. Uh, Lord, don't you care if we're perishing? Hey, HJ, cool out. Don't worry about it. I got this. Calm down. And then turn to the... Why is it that the Lord talks to the wind and the waves before the Lord talks to the disciples? I wrestled with that thing all weekend. The Lord finally gave me some insight. Jesus said, listen, the reason I didn't talk to the disciples first because I already talked to them. I told them everything they needed to know. Read up a few verses to the next verse in red, and before they got on the boat, I already told them, we are going over to the other side. I already gave them the destination. And Jesus does not talk to them as if to say in the storm, you ought to remember what I've done already told you. I told you before we got in the storm. You know what this reminds me of? Um, this reminds me of being raised by some old school parents. How many of y'all had old school parents? Okay, um, um, real, real old school. You, you remember my roof, my house, my rules? Uh-huh. You, you remember old school, uh, you tell your mama, I'm going to call the police. She said, you got to get to the phone first. <laughs> I, I was raised old school. Uh, Mike, there was no timeout in our house. Timeout is however long it took you to get up off the floor after your mama knocked you out. Let me tell you how you know you're old school. This is how I know I was old school. Because whenever we went to the store, before you go in the store, old school parents had a conversation with you. You all know you're old school. Here's the way the conversation went. Uh, we about to go in the store. Uh, don't touch nothing. Don't ask for nothing and you ain't getting nothing. Right, right. He said, listen, 
before we get in this thing, I want you to know the rules. Don't touch nothing, don't ask for nothing, and you ain't get nothing. And if you went in that store and you touched something or asked for something, mama would grab you, didn't I tell you, before we got in here, don't ask for nothing, don't touch nothing, and you ain't get nothing. Every time you panic in the storm, the Lord wants to grab you and say, didn't I tell you before this thing got started, I told you before your enemy showed up, no weapon formed against you would prosper. I told you before the shutdown, I'll supply all your needs. I told you before all hell broke loose, all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord. And the Lord says, remember what I told you. I told you what was meant for evil would work for your good. I told you weeping only endures for a night and joy comes in the morning. I told you they that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. Do me a favor, encourage somebody, tell them, remember what he said. I've got to go. I'm tired. It's a long day. I'm stressed. I'm exhausted. I got a paper waiting on me when I get home. She said, listen, I didn't talk to the disciples because I already talked to them. And the Lord says, maybe I didn't talk to them because they don't need to hear something. They need to see something. So watch this. The storm is a setup for Jesus to show how strong he is. He realizes y'all don't know me. So in order to show you who I am, I've got to take you into a storm that allows me to reveal my power so you can come out of the storm knowing who I am. And I want to suggest to you that every storm in your life ain't nothing more than an opportunity for God to teach you more about who God is. Can I help somebody? The storm is a classroom. In the storm, God is showing you what he's able to do. And if you've been listening, and if you've been learning, God showed you some things in 2018 that are meant to get you ready for 2019. If you've been paying attention, and if you've been watching God move, and if you've seen how God has answered, and you know it was the hand of God that did it, then God says you have come to the end of your class and now I need to know, did you learn what I tried to show you? You do know that you are now at the end of another semester. God has brought you through another year of God 101. And at the end of every class, on the last day, you've got to take your final exam. I don't mean to scare you, but I came to Alpha Street tonight to proctor your final exam. God has sent me at the end of this year to give you the final exam to make certain you learn what he tried to show you. Don't worry, it's an oral exam. You don't have to write nothing down. You just got to answer a few questions. Are you ready for your final exam? I want to see if you learned something. Um, Question number one. Won't he make a way for you? Question number two. Won't he answer your prayers? Question number three. Won't he move the mountain? Won't he open the door? Won't he take care of you? If you know the answer, touch your neighbor and tell them God is able. God is able. Uh, 
Well, I've got to leave y'all now. Happy New Year to each and every one of you. But watch the good news. The good news is that when Jesus speaks, the winds and the waves obeyed him. And everybody wants to shout about the wind and the waves. But that ain't the shout. The shout is not in chapter 4. The shout is in chapter 5. Because the next chapter begins like this. And they made it to the other side. Hey! And can I tell you why you ought to praise God? Because it's 1206 and you made it to the other side. side. Hallelujah, God. Thank you for the other side. Come on, would you pray with me, God? We are standing in 2019. Lord, I remember 1999 when they thought the world was coming to an end and here we are some nine years later and Lord I thank you that we made it to the other side there's some storms behind us but we made it there's some disappointment behind us but we made it Last year wasn't the best year, but we made it. And Lord, I just thank you that I'm standing on the other side. Lord, for every mountain, <laughs> for everything you did to bring me over, I thank you. Now, Lord, there's some work for me to do in this new year. There's a new me waiting on me to catch up with him. Thank you, God, for bringing me and the few I got with me over this sea. Thank you that my loved ones made it. Thank you that some of my loved ones are at rest with you. But I made it. And I don't take that for granted. I don't take it lightly. I made it to the other side. In Jesus' name. Jesus.